Okay, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the second in our four part series, a literary series given to us by Mark Schenker on Homer's Odyssey. And a special welcome to our live streamers coming and watching this program through YouTube simultaneously. And remember, we'll also have a recording of this that I will send a link around uh, tomorrow. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager at the Wilton Library. And I'm very pleased to be introducing this program, which is made possible with the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Couple of quick notes first. Your microphones and your cameras are off. You should keep them off during the entire program to avoid the distractions and background noises. And also because we have a very large audience, the way we'll handle the Q&A process is uh, I will open up a chat where people can chat directly with me only so send me questions, and uh, at the end of the program, I'll pass them on to Mark. Uh, because we have a lot of material to cover, uh, the Q&A period will be kind of short, maybe five minutes or so. Uh, but also, Mark is always happy to answer emails sent directly to him, and I always include his email address when I send out the link to the recording. So you can always email him with something if we don't get to it today. Uh, I'm not going to read his whole illustrious bio because you were all here last week. So uh, let me turn it over to Mark and uh, we'll start. Mark. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone, for either coming today for the first time or returning. Uh, I did get some questions via email in the week since the last talk, and I have addressed them. Uh, one comment I got today that I take seriously is someone asked if I would slow down. Uh, and she made the point that in trying to take notes, it would be helpful to her and she and I assume to others if I paused after certain points. I will say that I quite conscientiously told uh, Michael that I would be happy to have these lectures recorded because I had the idea that someone who wanted to take notes on the lectures, and I assume that some people but not everyone, could revisit the lecture at the leisure uh, having been in higher education all my adult life, I know it's a near impossibility to process information and also take notes on it. So my suggestion is to listen. And if you want to take notes, return uh, to the lecture um, uh, at the website uh, in order to take notes. But I'm not trying to trick you into listening to me twice. I'm grateful if you hear me once. And so I will take the advice or the request of the patron to heart, and I will be slowing down. Uh, let me say also that um, there are, in my experience, two major ways to address uh, works of literature. There are many, many ways, but in terms of my specialty, you can either talk about a work topographically, uh, you can give kind of the terrain of a great work or the terrain of a writer's career. You can talk about Shakespeare in broad terms of his tragedies, his comedies, the histories, or Renaissance aesthetics and so on. Or you can dive deeply into some aspect or a single work uh, in the image of my head, I think, as a kind of geologist. That is, you can mine down instead of surveying across. Now, ideally, you can do both of those things, but not in four hours. And so my bias for this lecture is to be topographical, to give you kind of the lay of the land and hope that I give you enough insight into ways that you yourself might pursue the poem in depth that you can do your geological work at your leisure. I'll remind you from last time uh, that the Iliad is a war poem that is in fact an anti-war poem and perhaps an occasion in the future will present itself that I could lecture on that other great Homeric poem. And that the Odyssey, while it appears to be a poem about wandering, uh, adventures, strange uh, creatures and distant locations, uh, that's part of the appeal of young people and high school students and adults. It is in fact a poem fundamentally about home, about reverence, and ultimately about civilization. And so that's the register that I'm going to be applying throughout the entire four lectures. And then the last thing from last time I'd like to remind you of 
is that the collective enterprise of ancient Greek literature can be seen as trying to locate human behavior, human existence below the immortal gods who are more like human beings than they might care to think and above the savage beasts who are more like human beings than human beings might think. And that is why the works, including the epics, the poems and the plays are so much about those extreme poles of immortality and bestiality when we try to find ourselves in the middle uh, of those opposites. So uh, this evening's lecture, which covers books seven through 12 in a general way, will not only bring us to the halfway point of the epic, that is 12 books of 24, it also deposits us at the brink of uh, Odysseus' return to Ithaca, Ithaca, which occurs within the first hundred lines or so of book 13. So a remarkable thing is he actually gets home about halfway through the poem and getting home isn't enough. He has to reclaim his home in multiple ways. And I do think uh, in many aspects, the last quarter of the poem uh, is the most accelerated uh, and the most interesting. Before we turn to the second quarter of the epic, uh, let me briefly review the role of our wandering hero in the first six books. Odysseus, as I've mentioned, is much discussed in the first four books of the poem, the so-called Telemachy, but he doesn't appear there. In book five, he shows up for the first time in the Odyssey, and the first words that he speaks in the poem reflect his frustration and his distrust of Athena's offer to help him get back home. You may remember that Athena has played both for the Trojans and against the Trojans, has tried to impede Odysseus and then wants to help him. So there's good reason for him to be suspicious. But the first words he speaks in the poem are passage home, question mark, never. Uh, his distrust of her and his frustration, a kind of despair. Uh, in the Old Testament, Moses despaired for a moment and he lost the view of the promised land forever. Uh, this is not that work of art. Uh, he's going to be forgiven. Athena proves, in fact, to be as good as her, her word, and Odysseus subsequently rejects Calypso's offer to remain with her as an immortal and chooses instead to embrace the pain or mortality of his continuing suffering. I mentioned last time that one meaning of uh, Odysseus is man of pain. When he meets Tiresias in the kingdom of the dead, Tiresias greets him as Odysseus, man of pain. He decides to reject that offer, to embrace mortal suffering, to remain loyal to faithful Penelope, and in his words, to travel home and see the dawn of my return, uh, the, the new day of his return. In book six, we see him landed in the Phaeacia, the land ruled by King Alcinous and Queen Arete. Although he's welcomed on the banks of the river in that kingdom by Princess Nausicaa, the book ends without him having gotten to the palace. She tells him, I'll go and you'll follow. And he's left to find his own way to the palace of her parents. And so book six ends with Odysseus praying that quote, among the Phaeacians, uh, I'm sorry, among the Phaeacian people, I may find some mercy and some love. That is, it's another threshold ending. Uh, the previous book ended with him going to sleep before he reveals himself to Nausicaa. The next book, this book ends with his waiting outside uh, in the country before he actually enters uh, the portals of the palace. Uh, this is very effective, of course, in serial narration, and it gives us an expectation or a surmise that it's likely that the books of the poem ended at meals or, or the end of the day, that there was a pause between the ending of one book and another, uh, which make perfect sense for installments, uh, like the old radio serials 
or Dickens novels, for example, that were published in installments every month, three or four chapters. And typically the chapter that ended an installment was a cliffhanger uh, coming from the old uh, serials of someone actually being held uh, dangling off a cliff. So uh, we see him again, just as the whole uh, quartet, uh, the whole six books tonight, and with him on the brink of, brink of returning to Ithaca, uh, he's left at the end of book six, waiting to enter uh, the palace. It's worth noting that book seven, when he actually does enter, is the first time we see Odysseus in the poem among mortals in a human household. Uh, this is a great accomplishment. He's been bedded. Uh, he's lived in domiciles with uh, Calypso and others. He's been on board ship but he has not in fact been among mortals uh, in a human household. Um, this is significant. Unlike the, sub, the subhuman and superhuman company that he's been keeping, the world of King Alcinous and Queen Arete is a decided, decidedly civilized space. Now for my undergraduates and for high school students that I talk about, they're least interested in the issues indoors. They're not really interested in the courtesy and the wine bearing and the bed making because they've been acculturated to want the exciting issues. But I say again, that if you wanna be a better reader of the poem, pay attention to these cultural touchstones. And there's one of them here. Before he enters the palace, we're told that he encounters, quote, a magnificent orchard and quote, a teeming vineyard planted for kings, and quote, beds of greens. So that is an orchard, a vineyard, uh, a farm. And that farm has springs from which the city people come to draw their water. The city people, that is civilized people, uh, civilized and city have a common root. Uh, the citizens come to the great springs on the domesticated landscape of the palace in order to thrive as civilized people. Uh, I, I mentioned last time it's worth repeating that the Iliad ends by invoking uh, Hector, an enemy of the Greek people who has died in his funeral rites, not as a great warrior or a great prince, but as a tamer of horses that is a man of civilization, uh, a man who knows how to manage a ranch, just as these people know how to tend a vineyard uh, and an orchard. And by the end of the poem, uh, the figure and fact of an orchard is gonna figure very prominently in uh, Odysseus's reunion with his father. So the hallmarks of civilization before he even gets indoors. Once Odysseus meets his host, their hospitality is so extreme that they offer him their, her, their daughter's hand in marriage. Now, just pages before, although it's been a long travel, he was offered immortality by joining with um, uh, uh, Calypso. Uh, we don't imagine that that was all, all, actually going to be a wedded union uh, there was nothing social about that. We don't imagine that they were going to move uh, and uh, uh, have uh, commerce with other people or meet her, her parents. But here, they're offering him a social contract. And one way to read the poem, and I suggested this in tonight's handout, is to see that people are more and more individuated as social beings as the poem goes on. Unnamed men are killed early men with names are killed later, uh, the, uh, the trip down to the kingdom of the dead, we meet many people who are named, they are given identities uh, that matter because Odysseus is getting closer and closer to the world of social relations. So the register of civilized comfort is reflected in the quality of the sleeping arrangements that they make for Odysseus, that is, not only to offer him their daughter's hand in marriage, which he declines, ever faithful to Penelope, but they also offer him 
the same kind of accommodations in something of the same language that King Nestor has offered to Callimachus in book three. And I'm gonna read the end uh, of book seven. And now as the two men, that is the king and Odysseus, exchange their hopes, the white armed queen instructed her palace, ma palace maids to make a bed in the porch's shelter, lay down some heavy purple throws, purple is the color of royalty, heavy purple throws for the bed itself, and over it spread some blankets, thick woolly robes, a warm covering laid on top. This is where we get our expression to actually make a bed, that is to actually constitute a bed from parts. Uh, torches in hand, they left the hall and fell to work at once. Torches because it's nighttime. Briskly prepared a good snug resting place and then returned to Odysseus, their guest. Up friend, time for sleep, your bed is made. How welcome the thought of sleep to that man now. So there after many trials, Odysseus lay at rest on a corded bed inside the echoing colonnade. Alcinius slept in chambers deep in his lofty house where the queen, his wife, arranged and shared their bed. So a small detail worth repeating. That line on a corded bed inside the echoing colonnade is exactly the same line that describes the bed that Nesta provided for Telemachus. And as with the earlier example, it's followed by the notion of a married couple in their shared bed. So this is worth a couple of comments. First, a corded bed, and perhaps your edition of the poem glosses that, or perhaps you looked it up, but for those who didn't, a corded bed means a bed that has below the mattress part, something like a box spring that is made of a network of small ropes of cords that are interlaced to provide the spring and support that you might get from a box spring. That is, it is not a bed that's made of mattresses thrown on the floor, no futon for the ancient Greeks, no air mattress. This is a bed, a corded bed is supported by cords. It's a kind of hammock. If you were to Google corded bed online, I'd suspect you'd see a picture of it if you like. This is the kind of bed they give him. This is the kind of bed King Nestor gave his son. And in both cases, it is associated with uh, bedded marital relations. And this is gonna matter because in the same way that, that the orchard becomes a touchstone of civilization, when uh, Odysseus uh, encounters his father after many years, the bed that Penelope and Odysseus used to share becomes a similar touchstone for the reunion of the husband and the wife. So uh, a small detail uh, that is not small in its consequence. Uh, in book eight, Alcinous announces that, quote, no one, I tell you, no one who comes to my house will languish long here, a heart struck for convoy home. Uh, he promises that he owes this stranger hospitality. And this is in the context of a ter terrible catastrophic curse that is rumored to fall on these people if they help Odysseus and in fact does. So after this guarantee that they will give him a uh, means of getting home, there follows a celebration that includes a bardic song of the Trojan War that brings Odysseus to tears. So we have to figure ourselves in the situation that in the first instances, the heroes of this poem would be in some kind of palace or great house. It may be that they're not staying overnight for the entire period of the festival, and they might be returning each afternoon to hear the next installment of the song, but they would be in some grand place listening to a bard sing this epic song that now includes a bard singing an epic song within it. So that kind of meta sense. Uh, and the, the song of the Trojan War brings Othello 
I'm sorry, Odysseus to tears, uh, also reminds us that the legend of the Trojan War has already passed throughout Greece and other places and is the subject of this kind of entertainment. The song is followed by physical competitions, foot race, wrestling, long jump, discus, boxing in the, in the kind of Greek Olympic tradition, as well as some taunting of Odysseus and his subsequent success at discus. So that taunting is meant to be good natured, uh, the kind of things that competing athletes might do uh, in the context of these competitions. And then the bard presents a second song about the revenge of Hephaestus, uh, the husband of Aphrodite, uh, the god of fire, who is malformed and is a blacksmith. Well, it turns out being a blacksmith is a craft well suited to someone with weak legs and strong arms, which is exactly how Hephaestus is described in the song. Uh, he's lame, we're told. At one point, um, Fagels in my translations uh, translate that as cripple. I'm going to read that word again later. I apologize for it in advance. I'm only citing it because that's the word he uses as his closest approximation to what Homer is using. Uh, it's not a word that I would ordinarily say. Uh, and of course, he has strong arms because he's done work with his upper body all of his uh, more or less immortal life. Now, so a god with strong legs, strong arms and weak legs avenges himself upon Ares, the god of war, and Aphrodite, uh, the uh, blacksmith's own wife. Um, uh, and that's what the song is about, that revenge. Well, we've just learned of Odysseus' success with the discus, that he has strong arms. And you may recall that when they say, what can you do um, beyond the discus? Can you do archery or boxing? He says he can do most anything except racing. He says that he can't uh, compete because, quote, I've taken a shameful beating out on heavy seas. No conditioning there on shipboard day by day. My legs have lost their spring. So besides reminding us that he has aged, it's one of those Homeric touches of realism that reminds you that because he's been shipbound so long, and for some of it waterlogged, he has lost some of the strength in his legs. And so he becomes a kind of double of Hephaestus, strong arms, he just won discus, he threw so far, no one even thinks of competing with him, and weak legs as he's just explained. And so the story of the revenge on Ares and Aphrodite for their adulterous relations in Hephaestus's mansion, we're told it's in his own home, and in quote, his marriage bed, that is a double defilement, uh, true irreverence, that story being sung by the bard with Odysseus uh, listening serves several purposes in the poem. It shows the punishment that irreverent behavior deserves everywhere in the poem, and we're going to see it especially in the cattle or oxen of the sun, depending on how your edition translates it. Those men, the whole crew, are killed and retribution is total un un unambiguous. They were warned more than once and they defiled um, a, a compact. So uh, irreverent behavior deserves such treatment. It's also a foreshadowing of Odysseus' revenge on the impiety of the suitors who are extreme violators of the norms of hospitality. They haven't committed adultery with uh, Penelope uh, but they would if they could, and they've come close to a kind of defilement by holding her hostage, uh, not removing themselves from her plantation. They may not be living in the house, but they're living on the lands, and by trying to force her into marriage with one of them. And lastly, the story of revenge, the story sung by the bard, shows that the weak can defeat the strong by means of cunning. 
that's the moral of the story. That's the satisfaction that little puny deformed Hephaestus takes over the war god. And this fact that the weak can defeat the strong by cunning explains how Odysseus has come this far in the story. If he had a business card, it would have as its slogan, uh, the weak can defeat the strong by cunning. That's what he does. And when that's revealed in the telling of the story of revenge, there's a chorus, a trio of immortals, a Hermes, Poseidon, and Apollo, who cheer on his Festus and makes fun of Ares for his comeuppance. And what's significant about that trio is two of them, Poseidon and Apollo, have been on the side of the Trojans since the Iliad. They are not themselves sympathetic at all to Odysseus. But when they hear this, when they see what happens there within the song uh, uh, about the revenge, uh, they declare that slow outstrips the swift. And in another celebration, the cripple wins by craft. And again, that's Fagel's translation and going for alliteration. But the point is the same, that it's cunning and craftiness that makes up for deficiencies in strength or speed. No wonder that the slow but crafty wanderer relished every note, we're told, of that strong of that song. We're told that Odysseus loves hearing that song because he gets what we should not miss, that it's a story that's illustrative of just what he himself has been doing and will do. Later on in the celebration, he exhibits extreme courtesy to Demodocus, that is the, uh, the bard of the Phaeacians. We wouldn't expect a visitor to give hospitality to a bard who's been performing. And he states that the muse herself loves the breed of harpers. So again, if you can get into the meta, that is the fiction within the fiction, we have the bard who is singing this tale to us as we're listening to it when we first hear the Odyssey, who includes in the song he's singing that the muse loves harp harpers, loves people who sing these songs. Uh, when that famous harper, Demodocus, sings again of the Trojan War for a second time in the celebration, that's how famed the story is, we're told that Odysseus melted into tears, an action that is expressed in a special kind of epic simile. And I talked last time and gave some examples of an epic simile. Uh, and if you weren't here, and you don't know what's entailed by that, I suggest you listen to the last uh, lecture. But this is a special kind of epic simile, and I'm gonna read the passage. Uh, Odysseus weeps often in the poem, most often because of despair about trying to get home. But here he's remembering the agony of his sufferings in the past. So here's the passage. That was a song, the, and uh, for those of you who are in the Fagels, and in case you're following along, it's around line 585 of book eight. If you're in another translation, it may be some short distance away from 585, but you'll recognize it from the context. That was a song the famous harper sang, but great Odysseus melted into tears running down from his eyes to wet his cheeks. As a woman weeps, her arms flung round her darling husband, a man who fell in battle, fighting for town and townsmen, trying to beat the day of doom from home and children. Seeing the man go down, dying, gasping for breath, she clings for dear life, screams and shrills. But the victors just behind her digging spear butts into her back and shoulders, drag her off in bondage, yoked to hard labor, pain, and the most heartbreaking torment wastes her cheeks. So from Odysseus' eyes ran tears of heartbreak now. So it qualifies as an epic simile because it spends a lot of time on what's not actually happening in this moment in the poem. There is no woman weeping as her husband 
uh, is killed and men are falling in battle. But is it, of course, an image of Troy? And of course, it's Trojan women who see their women, their men going down and see the day of doom on their home and children. And so remarkably, Odysseus is being compared not just to a weeping woman, which would be remarkable in itself, but a weeping Trojan woman. One of those uh, remarkable humane touches of the Greek poet where he extends his sympathy to the other side. And this kind of epic simile where there's a shock of what one thing is being compared to another is called a reverse simile. That is, it thwarts our expectations uh, that at minimal, minimally, uh, a weeping Odysseus would be compared to a Greek woman bemoaning the loss of her husband, possibly Penelope uh, mourning the likely death of her husband. But to reverse it and make the figure that of a Trojan woman is a testament to Homer's humanity, which we see constantly throughout both his great epics. So I think that's worth pausing over. Uh, after the second song uh, of Troy, um, Odysseus is invited to tell his own story and to tell it truly. And so the next three books, books nine through 12, are all narrated by Odysseus. Uh, and as I've noted in the handout, we have him who was previously completely absent from the first four books, doubly present as both a narrator and actor in the tale he's narrating. This is not a trivial thing to notice. Uh, it not only makes him the author of his tale and gives him uh, that, that authority, and there's a reason why author and authority are versions of the same word, but it reminds us that the highest praise uh, that Greek um, uh, poets could give uh, to the um, characters in their epics is that they were great in war and great in council, that they had the ability to fight and they had the ability also to argue. That is, they had the ability to be fierce and even savage, and they had the ability to be eloquent. So that he can tell his own story uh, is significant. I should say as a kind of footnote, you can imagine, and some people do more than imagine, that some of the fantastic events that Oedipus tells uh, without anyone there to contradict him because all his men are dead and knowing that he's cunning and knowing that he lies multiple times, it's possible that part of the performance is a creation of a persona that doesn't actually exist. That's certainly a possible reading of part of what he does, uh, although it's not the dominant reading. Most people want to believe in the mythical events that happen. Mythical because they contradict reality, not because uh, Odysseus is lying. So he has just, we should remember uh, as he sets out on his story, that he has just praised the breed of bards, that is the breed of storytellers. He's just said the muse loves people who tell stories. And so some of the approbation that he has just given to Demodocus uh, comes back and attaches to him in the kind of self-aggrandizement, which is very characteristic of Odysseus. In book nine, the, the Lotus Eaters quite baldly represent the threat to nostoi, N-O-S, T-O-I, that Greek word for the return home. Uh, and this threat results from their eating, uh, the crews eating the honey sweet fruit uh, that all memory of their journey home dissolved forever. I mentioned last time how much memory attaches to the restoration of uh, Odysseus to his homestead uh, and that forgetting is the great enemy and here we have a race of people who are addicted uh, to a natural drug that erases their memory. And the episode with the Cyclopes, the race of Cyclopes, the one-eyed savage giants represent another threat to civility. 
Now, there's so much interesting stuff that happens in the cave with the captured men and uh, Odysseus outwitting uh, Polyphemus uh, and almost doing himself in by his pride in having to explain who he is that has done this. That's all well known. But in the same sense of trying to give you an insight into the touches of poetry in the poem that are quite different from the plot and the exploits, I want to point out that right after there's a description of the lotus eaters and the men joining them by eating the lotus and forgetting the voyage home, there's this description of sailing on to the land of the high and mighty Cyclopes. And here's a description. Lawless brutes who trust so to the everlasting gods, they never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. That is, they don't domesticate. They're not breakers of horses. They don't make orchards or vineyards or beds of green. It goes on, unsown, unsown, unplowed, the earth teemed with all they need, wheat, barley, and vines swelled by the rains of Zeus to yield a big full-bodied wine from clustered grapes. They eat and they drink, but they don't do it by cultivation. They are not civilized. They have no meeting place for counsel, no laws either. No, up on the mountain peaks, they live in arching caverns, each a law to himself, ruling his wives and children, not a care in the world for any neighbor. That is a depiction of an ancient Greek nightmare. That is as anti-Greek as you can get, that description, ending with the word neighbor, who they don't recognize as someone they have any relationship to. Uh, the section on the Cyclopes is as valuable for that description as anything more interesting that happens with Polyphemus and his eating of the men and his uh, uh, almost thwarting the escape of Odysseus and others. Uh, and that's again, I hope a way to appreciate the poem beyond um, the sort of big ticket items. Book 10's depiction of Circe's transformation of the men into swine, that is the in, in, inhuman, the bestial, makes its own point. If this is a poem about civilization, the men are turned into swine. Uh, I taught this poem once in a college class, uh, this section of the poem, where one of the women uh, responded to this section of Circe turning the men into swine by saying, how could they tell? I'll let you draw your own conclusion. Uh, Odysseus is then told by Circe that he must travel down to the house of death and there uh, he must consult the ghost of Tiresias. Now, the kingdom of the dead, uh, which is the next section of the poem, is remarkable for many things, but I'm just gonna focus on two right now. I've already mentioned that the many people he encountered are named, they're individuals. Even in death, they have a kind of social status. That's significant, and it's another indication that Odysseus is getting closer to home. But two encounters are especially important. The first is that he uh, has met Elpinor um, because the preceding book has concluded with the death of Elpinor, who is not killed by a spell or a god or a monster or even a shipwreck, but because having strayed from his mates, that's a quote, having strayed from his mates and having, fall, having fallen asleep on the roof of one of Circe's halls, he falls and breaks his neck because he awakes with a start and forgets to climb back down the long ladder. This is another Homeric touch that in the middle of a poem of great exploits and unimaginable events, uh, a guy uh, what's the Greek word for it? I think it's schmo, uh, forgets that he's sleeping outside and he breaks his neck. He is not treated as a fool, despite my cheap joke. Uh, this is human nature. You fall asleep, 
because you want to sleep alone. Maybe you want to sleep outside. Maybe you need the support of the roof tiles for your back. You wake up with a start and you fall down. You survive all of the kinds of calamities uh, and you fall uh, and break your neck. It's existential. It's the kind of thing that Sartre would have a field day with. It's also part of Homer's view of the range of events in humanity. So he's going to meet Elpinor uh, in the kingdom of the dead, and he's going to be asked to bury him, uh, give him funeral rites rather, and he go he's going to return to Circe's island to do that. As eager as he is to get home, he is going to pay the debt of reverence, Odysseus is, to go and bury, uh, give funeral rites to this shipmate who died by falling off a roof. Uh, that's very, very significant. Uh, and then um, he does what he's told by consulting with Tithonus, who is a blind prophet. So there's an oxymoron who has been both uh, a female and a male because he asked to have his sex changed so he could answer the question whether women or men uh, enjoy sex more. So Tithonus, I'm sorry, Tiresias is this remarkable figure who is blind but can see the future, who is both a woman and a man. He appears in most cases as a man. And uh, Odysseus has to consult with him because Circe said so. And this is what he's told by Tiresias, that after he kills all the men and reclaims his home, carry your well-planed oar until you come to a race of people who know nothing of the sea. That is, walk inland from Ithaca to get as far away from the shoreline as possible whose food is never seasoned with salt, strangers all to ships and their crimson prows and long slim oars, wings that make ships fly. And here is your sign, unmistakable, clear. Here's the sign that you've gotten to that distant place. So clear you cannot miss it. When another traveler falls in with you and calls that weight across your shoulder, a fan to winnow grain. So if you can imagine this long paddle being mistaken for what's called a winnowing fan, you batter, you hold the, the long end and you batter the blade end against the wheat to get the grain off of it. When that happens, then plant your bladed balanced oar in the earth and sacrifice fine beasts to the Lord God of the sea, Poseidon, a ram, a bull and a ramping wild boar, then journey home and tender noble offerings up to the deathless gods who rule the vaulting skies to all the gods in order. This is enormously significant and I'm gonna pause on it because although we're told that Odysseus will do this, it is not actually depicted in the poem later on because the poem is going to end with peace between the warring parties of Ithaca. But we can be sure that the Greeks understood that Odysseus would do this. And this is a remarkable thing. Uh, he's told to take an oar and it's bladed and balanced. That is, it is crafted as an artifact. It is in fact, another hallmark of civilization. Not just that you can make sailing ships, but you can make a bladed balanced oar. And because Tithonus knows that the only way that Odysseus can show reverence for Poseidon relenting and letting him get home, this is the god of the sea, is to promise him a shrine among people who have no way of knowing Poseidon. And how can we tell they have no way of knowing? They don't know what an oar is or what it's good for. A remarkable invention on the part of the collective group uh, that we call Homer. Uh, and so let's pause for a moment because I've already mentioned the orchard that later on is gonna be a touchstone with Laertes, his father uh, and 
Odysseus is going to make reference to his father's orchard. His father has become a fruit grower in retirement, no longer king. Um, uh, and what is an orchard but uh, domesticated trees? Uh, that is, it's not a forest. It's not just a bramble. It is cultivated land, unlike uh, the Cyclopes. And I mentioned that the bed that Penelope and Odysseus shares becomes a touchstone for the two of them when she is not sure that her husband is the man he says he is. And you will learn, and maybe you already know, that that bed is also associated with a tree, a wood that is, an artifact, something carved out of wood. And now we have this balanced and bladed ore, another crafted piece of wood. Well, what's more natural than trees? And yet in each case, it's not a tree that is the touchstone for remembering and recognition. It's an artifact. It's an orchard, cultivated trees. It's a bed uh, carved out of a tree. It's an ore uh, carved out of wood used here to say, let's bring Poseidon, news of Poseidon to these people who've never heard of them. I think it's one of the most remarkable touches in the poem and like the Trojan horse that never appears in the Iliad, Odysseus is actually doing this, is not depicted in the poem, but he's tasked with it here. And there's every reason to think that he would pay that debt. So that's a visit uh, to the kingdom of the dead. And in book 12, the cattle of the sun, we have the sirens and we have Scylla and Charybdis, but we also have as I said, the total and unambiguous destruction of the crew who are impious and who have been warned twice and we've been warned a third time that this is not something you can do. Uh, a harbinger again of the impiety of the uh, suitors, the notion that a guest eats what they can eat and does not eat what's forbidden and connected to a kind of ur myth about certain limitations being put on freedom. So it's not true uh, that this story comes from the Genesis story of the forbidden fruit, but very likely that both stories derive from a, uh, the same kind of Ur myth, the same kind of source, source myth, that what God or gods do is they bear, um, they create a relationship of reverence by setting limits on what you can or cannot do. And Milton in his depiction of Genesis and Paradise Lost makes the case that there was nothing magical about the apple. It's just that God in order to be God and in order to teach his creatures to be reverent gave them a limit. And the limit was you have everything you want except that fruit. And of course, human nature being what it is, that fruit became the only thing they wanted. You may remember some years ago, Tipper Gore led an initiative to label uh, record albums, rock albums, with the sticker that says, this album contains explicit lyrics, thinking that it would keep children, young people away from it. And of course, those are the albums they look for. That's human nature. And so uh, this idea of you can't eat the cattle of the sun is just one demarcation of what a guest should not do. Have everything you want on the island, just don't do that one thing. And then so typical of human nature, that's the very thing they do. So lastly, their utter destruction, their complete and total destruction without mercy is meant to show that's what's deserved by the kind of irreverent behavior of those who've been warned more than once. And it's going to underpin the total and unambiguous destruction of the suitors so many books later. So I'll pause there and turn to Michael if he got any chat questions that he'd like to pass on. <coughs> Actually, Mark, I, I think you've uh, I think you've challenged people tremendously, and uh, 
they may you may get some questions as a follow up to email to you after people have a little time to process this and really think through it. Uh, there was a lot there. I was uh, uh, I was jotting some notes myself, even though I'll have to do that again with the recording. But I just had I, one idea that I want to just throw out to you and just see what you think about it. It's not so much a question other than what you think about this concept or idea. So we have this story. It's a journey back to human civilized society in some ways. It's a lot more than that. But there are also so many dichotomies posed here. And I can, I can imagine the journey as being a journey from one pole of the dichotomy to the other one. So you have, you have the journey from war and death back to home and hearth and family. And you have the journey from barbarism back to civilization. You have the journey from the battlefield back to the council chamber or the journey from the need to, the need to fight well to the need to be able to speak well. And, it, and the more I think about it, the more these dichotomies multiply. And I find them kind of like in my mind, like stacked up like analogies in the way you can think about this whole epic. Uh, I, I think I, I don't have any disagreement with that. It occurred to me while you're speaking uh, that I should make the point uh, that you could draw a comparison between the Odyssey in one regard with two very famous and different literary works of journeys to strange places, uh, Don Quixote and The Wizard of Oz. Uh, you get a sense of my background by thinking about that for a moment. So here's the thing about the Odyssey. You might say, well, Schenker, if Homer is so careful to want to tell us the values of reverence and homecoming and civilization, why didn't he just give us a year in the life of Penelope, Telemachus, and Odysseus? Why not just show the virtues of being home? Well, because he was a poet and he knew what we wanted was, we wanted to see what the other side is like, what all the opposites of those experiences are, so that he can recognize that there's no place like home. So take the example of Don Quixote. Cervantes believed, at least nominally, that one of the problems with romantic literature, bombastic uh, mystical literature about impossible happenings, is that it created a false impression of reality in impressionable readers. And he creates in Don Quixote, one of the great works of fiction in the Western world, a man who um, enacts that. Um, that impressionism and having been overfed on romantic books, that is books about exploits and losing his mind, he goes out and imagine he's a knight errant and he tilts at windmills and so on. He's wrong about everything he does because he's addled, but the source of his being addled is works of remarkable journeys. And then he comes back home. And when he comes back home, he decides to renounce all romantic literature. And so Cervantes has his cake and eats it too. He can say, you know what's bad? It's bad to read too many uh, romance books. Let me give you a 500 page romance book and let me have the hero in it, disown it at the end. So that you have the journey and the return home at the same time. In The Wizard of Oz, people are likely relieved to know that Dorothy gets back home again. There's no place like home. Uh, and if you realize that everything that's happened in color was a dream, and the moral you take from it is, wow, we should just avoid the dreams. If your idea of The Wizard of Oz, it should be the eight minutes of the opening and the closing in black and white, you miss the point. That is uh, Oz, uh, I'm sorry, Frank Baum and the filmmakers want to make the point that there's no place like home. And the way they're gonna make it is with a remarkable technicolor, musical, fun-filled, extravaganza of a very strange place to make the point of getting back home. But no one would want to give up Oz for Kansas, even though Kansas is where you belong. This is very much the strategy, it occurs to me as I sit here, of the Odyssey. The point being made is Ithaca is where he belongs, 
but we're going to spend thousands of lines of showing you how he doesn't quite get there yet. Uh, I think that is a little different from what you were saying, um, uh, Michael, but it feels to me like a good way to end the evening. Thank you, so, Michael, and thank everybody again for your attention. Thank, thanks, Mark. And uh, again, to everyone, uh, if you've got a question after you've had some time to think about this, uh, I'll put Mark's email on the link to the recording that I'll send out tomorrow. And feel free to uh, feel free to send it right to him. And, and thanks can, very much, Mark, for a great session. Yep. We'll see thank you, you Michael. And thank you, everyone, again, for your attention. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.